Several years ago, a friend of ours invited Shannon and I uh, to go on a hike. Uh, we met him up on uh, top of the world. We we're going to hike just right around there on top of the world. Going to go under the Foothills Parkway, just around that area. And we were hiking um, off trail. And our friend assured us that he knew what he was doing. <laughs> he had done this hike. Plenty of times before, um, it was going to be great, and we set off on our hike, filled with plucky optimism <laughs> that soon uh, vanished. So our uh, once confident leader <laughs> slowly became less and less confident, and we became less and less confident in him <laughs> and his ability to guide us through the woods. So. After a while, we realized that we are disoriented, lost in the woods. So we're, we're walking around. We finally um, find ourselves at uh, the other end of top of the world. So there where the lake is, if you guys have been up there. And then we decided to stick to the road. So we had to walk on the roads all the way to the exact opposite side up there. So a two-hour hike ended up being about a five, six-hour hike. Um, not as much fun as we had anticipated. <laughs> but the point is, it can be really easy to start well, to know what you're doing, to have a clear direction, and then it can also be easy to get disoriented, to find yourself lost, to lose sight of your goal. And that's what we see in today's passage, that the apostles, they're, they're oriented towards the mission of making disciples. They find themselves disoriented by a, a sharp disagreement. But thankfully, they show us, and, and the Holy Spirit shows us, how to reorient ourselves towards the mission that God has for us. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. The passage we'll read this morning really serves as a, as a bridge between what's come before with uh, this team of Paul and Barnabas and, and Mark being a missionary team, going and planting churches in chapters 13 and 14. And now there's going to be a shift to Paul's second missionary journey as we get into chapter 16, where he has a, a new team. And this, this passage really serves as kind of the, the link between those two. So let's begin reading in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36. Hear the words of Luke as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with him to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, 
and they increased in numbers daily. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for giving us your Spirit-breathed Word. Help us to pay attention to it closely as a light shining in a dark place. Help us to be like newborn infants, longing for the pure spiritual milk of your Word, that by it we may grow up into salvation. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. And I pray that Christ the Lord would be honored as holy in our hearts today. So just as it says here in this passage, strengthen us. Help the disciples here to increase even this morning. We ask this for the glory of your great name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll summarize our passage this morning in this way. Every disciple is called to make disciples, even when it's hard. Every disciple is called to make disciples, even when it's hard. And we see this in the lives of Paul and Barnabas. So, Look with me back one verse, so verse 35. Here we see, really, Paul and Barnabas, they are in a state of orientation. They are mission-oriented towards what Christ has called them to do. It says, But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. So these two men, they are focused on their ministry for the Lord. They're committed to their mission. So I want to ask you, what is your ministry? What is your mission? Now see, Paul and Barnabas, they knew. They spent a long time preaching and teaching at the church in Antioch, which was really their, their home church. So they were just opening up the scriptures. They were helping those believers to grow in their faith in Jesus and their love for Jesus and their obedience to Jesus. Then Paul wanted to shift. He says, there's all these churches we started and we want to go check on them and see how they're doing, see how their souls are. That's because Paul, he didn't come to town and and set up a tent, have a big event, get some people to make a decision for Christ, and then leave, never to return. Paul knew that discipleship takes time. It's a long process. It's a lifelong process. Look at how this looks in the passage once they got to it. (laughs) Chapter 15, verse 41. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Look at 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So that's what Paul's doing. He's strengthening and encouraging these believers to be able to follow Christ. And and new believers are being made. Disciples are being added to their number. Now, we talk a lot about discipleship, but I, I love Mark Dever's really clear, biblical, succinct definition He says that discipleship is doing life together with other people as you all journey towards Christ. When put that way, it doesn't feel that threatening or that much of a big deal, right? It's it's, you're all journeying towards Christ. You need other people to join you on that journey. That's discipleship. So again, I want to ask you, What is your mission? What is your ministry? Because because every member of Christ's church has a ministry. Every disciple is a disciple maker. We talk a lot about Ephesians 4, where it says that pastors and teachers are given by Christ to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We equip you to do the work of ministry so that 
every member of the church can build up the body of Christ, can attain the unity of the faith, can grow in the knowledge of the Son of God, can reach mature manhood in Christ. In the book of Acts, right, it's, a, it's all hands on deck. Right? There's no spectators. There's no people on the sidelines. Everyone is involved in the work of the kingdom. <laughs> now, in the book of Acts, discipleship comes up a lot. It's kind of a big theme in the book of Acts. And so maybe you have sat under the preaching of God's word week after week, month after month, and the Spirit has been convicting you of, of, I need to be in the lives of other Christians. Or I need to be reaching this person who's far from Christ at my work or in my family or in my neighborhood. And you're thinking, okay, I want to get involved. And it can be easy to go from kind of zero to 60 and to say, all right, I, I've been inactive, but so I'm going to go sign up for a ministry or find someone to meet with or have some program to go to every night of the week. Okay, calm down. <laughs> That's probably not feasible. It's definitely not healthy. It's like a, you know, New Year's comes around and you're like, okay, it's New Year's. So I'm going to go on the carnivore diet. I'm just going to eat meat and I'm going to lift weights three times a day. It's going to be awesome. No, it isn't. <laughs> you're going to do that for one day. You're going to puke your guts out. You're never going to do it again, right? No. Start small. Do something that's attainable. Find one person. Find one person. And do exactly what Paul did. Right? Read the Bible with them. Pray with them. See how they're doing. Check in with them. That was what Paul was doing. He said, we need to go see how these brothers are doing. Encourage them. Strengthen them. If you are a parent, you have your ministry. Did you notice that in chapter 16, verse 1, it mentions Timothy and his believing mother. And we know from the rest of Scripture that you know Timothy, this this godly man, this, this missionary, he wasn't shaped that way primarily by Paul, but by Lois and Eunice, his mom and grandma. So if you're a parent, you have been given a mission and a ministry in your home to shape an eternal soul. Now, as you find that one person, Remember, it doesn't have to be complicated. Discipleship is doing life together with others as you journey towards Christ. And if you want to be an overachiever, find two people. <laughs> find someone who doesn't know Jesus. Find someone who knows Jesus. Ideally, bring them together. Okay, just go grab coffee with uh, a non-Christian friend and a Christian friend. That's, that's a powerful combination. And as you do this, you'll find that you're strengthened in the faith as well. Discipleship is always mutual. It always goes both ways. But maybe you're someone who is a faithful disciple maker. You are pouring your life out into the lives of others. You've, you've spent years just faithfully serving Christ and his church and his kingdom. You are oriented towards the mission. Well, in that state of orientation, challenges can come. Difficulties can arise, and you can find yourself disoriented. And that's exactly what happens in this passage where the disciples or the apostles find themselves disoriented by conflict, disoriented away from the mission. So let's read starting at 15, verse 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches." If you have any 
inclination that the apostles were some kind of superhuman Christians who never had any problems, this passage should show you otherwise. This is kind of a shocking scene where these two veteran missionaries, these two beloved friends of over 10 years at this point, they get in a disagreement and they separate from one another. So if you remember back in chapter 13, the Holy Spirit sets Paul and Barnabas apart for the work of ministry, of bringing uh, the gospel of Christ to the nations. And they take with them a young man named John Mark as their assistant. But early on in that ministry, in Acts 13, verse 13, John Mark leaves. He withdraws. He, He abandons the mission. And we don't know why that is. The scripture is silent on John Mark's motivations. You know, possibly it was cowardice in the face of growing opposition. It might have been he just couldn't uh, handle the, the harsh conditions of missionary life. It also seems like at the, the point where John Mark leaves, there seemed to be a possible shift in their travel plans. So it could have been a, a disagreement in the strategy of what they were doing. We don't know. But we do know is that John Mark left. And this became a point of contention between Paul and Barnabas. They couldn't agree on what to do. So Barnabas, he says, we should bring Mark with us. We know from Colossians 4 that Barnabas and Mark are cousins. So that might have played a part in this. But Barnabas is saying, let's take him with us. Let's give him another chance. And Paul is saying, hey, I mean, I, I love Mark. You know, he, he's still a Christian. He, you know, he, I love him, but we shouldn't take him with us. It's not wise. He abandoned us once. We're, we shouldn't bring him with us. And they couldn't agree on what to do. <laughs> now, as I've studied for this passage, I've seen so much time and energy spent by teachers and preachers on trying to pick sides. So who was right? Was Paul right or was Barnabas right? And I think that just misses the point. This is not an argument that we should take sides on. Luke, who wrote this, he was one of Paul's very close friends, and he wrote this as an unbiased third party. He doesn't take sides in the passage. I don't think we should either, because this is a hard issue. This kind of disagreement Because it's not clear in Scripture what they are to do. This issue is not addressed in the Bible. So what do you do if missionaries set out and then one of them leaves? One of them doesn't continue on with the work. Do you let them right back in to that ministry? Are they kicked out of that ministry forever? Is there some kind of probationary period? You know, after six months, after a couple years, you know, you, you've proven yourself, you can come back in. We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us instructions for this particular issue. It's a matter of prudence, of wisdom. A matter that the scriptures, again, don't give specific instructions for. And these kind of disagreements they can be some of the most difficult situations that come up in our Christian relationships. But remember, earlier in chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas stood side by side for the faith of the gospel at the Jerusalem council. They were in perfect agreement saying, no, you will add nothing to the gospel of grace. Not circumcision, not the law of Moses, nothing. Christ's blood is sufficient to save. They were completely united in the core tenets of the faith, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were united in Him. But they didn't see eye to eye on this secondary, tertiary issue. It's often the way it is. You have friends and brothers and sisters in the church, and you have such good fellowship, you agree on the gospel, you believe in the same Lord. But then you find out that they have a different view than you do on the end times or on the age of the earth. 
or on God's sovereignty and salvation or, or the gifts of the Spirit or baptism or, or a host of different topics. And that can be very disorienting. It can cause us to lose our focus on our main priority of making disciples. Discipleship is about people, and people can be difficult. Amen? (laughs) These disagreements, these clashes, these conflicts, they can discourage us. They can cause us to drift and to grow apathetic. Now, Ken Sandy... He talks about three ways that we often handle conflict. One way is peace breaking. Peace breaking. So this is just a nasty conflict. Not healthy at all. We read from Galatians 5 earlier, right? Fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. That's what that looks like. It looks like trying to win a fight over restore relationship. It looks like hostility. And that can happen in person and very often does, but in the age of the internet, this is all the more the case. Where you can be friends with a fellow believer for years, you can have sweet fellowship with them, and then you see them post something online, you're like, I can't believe it. They said that? They think that? Oh, I need to get on my keyboard and just show them what's what. No, you don't. (laughs) You need to repent. If this has been your approach to conflict, you need to repent. You need to make it right. If there are broken relationships between you and a fellow believer in Christ, go and make that right today. Have the conversation. Make the phone call. Be slow to anger. Be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. Now, the second approach is peace faking. Peace faking. I think a lot of us fall into that category. So this is not where we tackle conflict head on. It's not where we're butting heads. It's where we just ignore it. We avoid conflict we have a disagreement with a fellow believer. We just sweep it under the rug. We, we ignore it. And that can seem like a good strategy at the time. You know, it feels comfortable. But in the long term, that is a dangerously destructive approach to conflict. Because what happens is that issue, whatever it is, it can, it can just fester under the surface. And it can grow larger and larger and larger in your minds until you see that person on Sunday morning and you kind of want to avoid them. They reach out to you and you're, you're slow to respond. You stop responding altogether. You definitely don't reach out to them. And the relationship gets severed. If that has been your approach to conflict, again, I say repent. Repent. Go and have that conversation. It may be an awkward, uncomfortable conversation. That's okay. The Spirit will help you as you step out in faith and obedience. Have that conversation. Make that right. Maintain the unity of the faith. Now, one thing to keep in mind is These disagreements, these conflicts, these clashes that can seem so big to us, they will seem like nothing when we are joined with our brothers and sisters worshiping the living God around his throne. That day will come very soon. And when you, with your brother who you disagreed with on earth, are worshiping your Savior in heaven, do you think that a disagreement on a minor doctrine your disagreement on politics or culture or whatever it is, do you think that that disagreement's going to matter? Not at all. So if it's not peace-breaking and peace-faking, what is it? Well, it's peace-making. Peace-making. And, and Paul and Barnabas are a great example of this. You might think, how is Paul and Barnabas, how are they a great example? They, they got a disagreement and they separated. Well, well hang with me. 
Okay? Peacemaking isn't always sitting around a campfire holding hands singing kumbaya. They had a sharp disagreement, but they handled it as mature followers of Christ. They didn't talk ill of each other. They didn't cast blame on one another. They didn't take things personally. There were no hurt feelings here. Okay, In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul speaks fondly of Barnabas. In Colossians 4, he speaks well of John Mark. He says, if he comes to you, receive him. They were still in fellowship. They were still united in Christ. But at the same time, they didn't avoid it. They stood their ground. They stood firm on their convictions, and they talked through their differences. Unity is not the same as uniformity. We can be united and not be uniformly the same. We should not expect to have cookie-cutter Christians in the church who think, believe, talk, and act in the exact same way. We will have our differences on secondary issues, and we can remain united around the gospel. That's what I always loved about going to the Together for the Gospel conference, is that you'll see people in the crowd and in the you know, speaking lineup. You have Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, Anglicans, more who disagree on all kinds of things, but who come together for the gospel, who unite around Jesus Christ. So though this conflict could have disoriented them away from their mission, and though conflict can disorient you away from your mission and your ministry, it doesn't have to. Because as we see in this passage, every individual involved became reoriented towards the mission of making disciples. (laughs) Let's start reading at verse 39, about halfway through. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and Elystra, A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So it seemed like a conflict that could have extremely negative ramifications. It turned out to be worked by the Lord for good, right? He works all things together For good. In their separation, one missionary team becomes two. Now they can cover more ground for Jesus. And it seems like they agreed to split up the work. So Barnabas and Mark, they go to Cyprus, which was Barnabas' hometown. And and that was the first part of the uh, missionary journey back in chapter 13. That was before Mark kind of bailed out. So it makes sense they would take that half of the mission. Paul gets Silas, and they go on the other half of the mission to visit the other churches. So they split the work up. They cover more ground. In the kingdom, this isn't division. It's multiplication. This is really a divide-and-conquer strategy that King Jesus uses to disciple the nations, to get the gospel out. So my neighbor, he is a uh, Presbyterian pastor, about 40 years my elder. And him and I have great fellowship, over-the-fence fellowship, conversations uh, about the Lord, uh, about the Scriptures. But we can't agree on baptism. He's Presbyterian. He believes that uh, biblically you should baptize the infants of believers. And I believe, again, based on my biblical convictions, that you should baptize Uh, confessing believers only. And we've actually talked about that. We had a good, enjoyable conversation about that. But because of that disagreement, 
This morning, probably right now, he is preaching the gospel in his church in Knoxville. And I'm preaching here. The gospel is being proclaimed in Knoxville and the gospel is being proclaimed in Maryville. That is not division. That is multiplication. That's a good thing. So let's, as we think through how these individuals in this passage reoriented themselves towards this mission of preaching the gospel, reaching the lost, making disciples, I want to kind of look through their eyes and think through the perspective of the five individuals in this passage. Of course, you have Paul. All right, Paul, he was laser focused in his devotion to make disciples. Right? He just plows, plows ahead, right? He's going to make disciples. Conflict didn't slow him down. He kept moving forward. And you might be someone who is just on fire and motivated to make disciples. And you might think, oh, am I a little intense? Am I a little too much? No, <laughs> keep going. Right, that's how Paul was. He was devoted to making disciples. Now, after a conflict with a longtime friend, a longtime co laborer in the gospel, Paul could have thought, you know, this whole working together thing, these relationships, that's difficult. So I'm just going to cut the dead weight. I'm going to go solo, I'm going to go on my own. Right? He could have thought to himself and finished the sentence, if you want something done right, do it yourself. But that wasn't Paul's response at all. Paul knew his need for camaraderie, for fellowship, for partnership, for community. And Paul found his one person. He found Silas. He gets a new partner. That's because Jesus doesn't give you a mission to fulfill on your own. You need partners to help you, to encourage you, to work alongside you. Paul almost never ministered alone. He always had a team with him. And if you've been hurt by the church in the past, if you've been hurt by relationships in the past, that can be an incredibly difficult experience to live through but isolation will not make it any better. Isolating yourself will only make it worse. Find that one person. Paul found Silas. Find one person you can have in your life for mutual encouragement, for a companion on the journey towards Christ. So that's Paul. There's also Silas, and don't skip over him. We often skip far too quickly over Silas. <laughs> you know, if you go to Amazon and to the book section and you just type in the Apostle Paul and press enter, you will find hundreds and hundreds of books written about Paul. Paul's life, the history of Paul, the theology of Paul, all of that. If you search Silas, you will find nothing. Zero. He might be mentioned in some books here and there, but there's no book devoted to Silas. And that's because we know almost nothing about him. The, the scriptures don't tell us much. He played a supporting role. He had a behind-the-scenes ministry. His life was not in the spotlight. And more than likely, neither will yours and neither will mine. So don't grow discouraged if you feel like your Christian life is mundane and ordinary and boring. Don't give in to jealousy over other Christians who seem to get more attention or recognition for their work than you do. Don't grow bitter if it seems like your faithfulness isn't noticed by men. Your praise comes from God. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There is a special glory in a long, slow, unseen obedience. Think about Mark and Barnabas. They kind of teamed up at the end of this passage. Imagine how Mark would have felt in this situation. He had been given a ministry. He had been given a mission, and he blew it. He had failed, and everyone knew it. 
I mean, think about this. His failure is recorded in the Bible. (laughs) That's pretty rough. And his failure had broken up the greatest missionary duo in history. He makes Yoko Ono look like a great unifier. (laughs) Just imagine the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment. And that might be you. You might think that because of your sins and your failures that you're disqualified from the work of the kingdom. You might think that you can't do anything great for God because of your past or even because of your present or the fear of the future. But praise God, this wasn't the end of Mark's story. At the end of Paul's life, he actually writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and says, bring Mark with you. He is very useful to me for ministry. And we don't know when or how, but at some point, Mark became restored. He was useful to Paul again for ministry. And don't forget, Mark is the one that wrote the gospel according to Mark. The Holy Spirit used this seeming failure to write one of the four gospels in Holy Scripture. Hey, Jesus can use you. He wants to use you, not despite your sins and failings, but because of them. Think about the new level of humility and reliance on Christ and just a deep realization of his need for grace that Mark had. He was now ready to be truly useful in the king's service. And we don't know exactly the process that went through for Mark to be restored, but no doubt Barnabas was involved. He had the nickname given by the apostles, the son of encouragement, the son of comfort. After Paul was converted and he went from being a terrorist trying to throw Christians in prison to becoming a Christian himself and no one trusted him, which makes sense. Barnabas was the first one and the only one at first to give him a chance to accept him, to bring him in. Right, dealing with broken, difficult, sinful people. That was, that was Barnabas' specialty. That was his, his niche. And you, you need someone like that in your life for your encouragement. You need those people in your life. And you need to be that kind of person for someone else, for their encouragement and edification. Every one of us needs these kind of relationships. And that's why we emphasize growth group so much. When you come to growth group, that's a time to encourage and to be encouraged, to comfort and to be comforted, to console and to be consoled, to strengthen and to be strengthened. If we want to reorient ourselves to make disciples, we need to surround ourselves with sons and daughters of encouragement. Not only that, we need to become a son or a daughter of encouragement. And how do you do that? Not in isolation. It's getting in there in the trenches, in doing life with other people, strengthening them, encouraging them. So that's Mark and Barnabas. And lastly, think of Timothy. This is the first introduction we have to Timothy in the scriptures in chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. At this point, he's probably in his teens or in his early 20s, and he's really serving as kind of John Mark's replacement. Mark was a young guy. Paul was kind of mentoring him. Now Mark's gone. He needs a new one. He he, he goes and finds Timothy, and Paul loved to mentor young guys. He just seemed to have this gravitational pull that would just bring young men into his orbit so that he could... um, influence them and shape them and mold them into mature uh, followers of Christ. And I can't help but read that and think about that without my mind being drawn to Bob Pear. Because Bob, everywhere you see him go, he has, you know, at least one guy in his early 20s following him around with some huge, thick book of theology, right? Bob's training those guys up. And that's Paul's discipleship plan as laid out in in Titus chapter 2. It's very simple. He says, 
Older women, train the younger women. Older men, train the younger men. So older Christians, more mature Christians, not just in in years, but in maturity, find that one person that you can help mature in the faith. Find that young man, that young woman who can become your apprentice in following Jesus. You might ask, well, old old man, old woman, how old is old? (laughs) Well, everybody's older than somebody else. You may not believe it, but there are people in this body who need you as a more mature Christian to help them as they walk with Christ. Okay, there may be a lot of you thinking, no, I can't make disciples. I need to be discipled. Well, you need both. You need both. If you have the gospel, if you're a Christian, you do. If you have the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, you do. If you have the word of God and you do, you have enough to disciple someone else. And we're here to equip you for that work of ministry. Hey, come and talk to us. We'll help you. We'll give you resources. We have evangelism and discipleship trainings to help you out with this. We want to help you learn how to disciple other believers. And remember, Timothy was in his teens, maybe his early 20s at this point. So I want to talk to those of you who are young, in your teens, in your 20s. Because in my early 20s, so I'll be 30 in about two weeks, okay? I'm about out of young man status, I guess. Three kids in 30. Shannon keeps pointing out little gray hairs on the side, so. Um, But when I was in my early 20s, There were three men who took me under their wing and mentored me. It's Brent Blake, Donnie Abbott, and Ken Taggart. And those three men were a huge influence on my life. I literally don't know what I'd be doing right now if it wasn't for those men. I definitely wouldn't be staying here preaching. Find a mentor. Find a discipler, you young people. Find the most godly, the most mature the most Christ-like, the most loving, the most wise Christian you can find and get to know them. Spend time with them. Ask them to disciple you. It will change the course of your life. So Paul and Timothy, while they're a great example of that kind of uh, discipler and disciple relationship, they're also a great example of just focused, full-throttled discipleship. Did you find it curious, as we read this passage earlier, that in verse 3, Paul circumcised Timothy? That should, that should strike you as odd. Because we've just spent a whole chapter. We've spent the last three sermons here talking about how the church convened a meeting in Jerusalem, and Paul was one of the main speakers there saying, no, you don't have to circumcise new Christians for them to be Christians. Paul has made a very big deal about this. In Galatians 2, Paul says that he brought Titus along with him, a Greek Christian, and he pretty much said, you're not going to lay your hands on him. Titus is not getting circumcised. And even in the next verse, in verse 4, it says that Paul and Timothy were delivering the decisions that were made at the Jerusalem council. So what is going on? Is Paul a hypocrite? Is he inconsistent? After all of this, why is he turning around and circumcising Timothy? Well, the answer is fascinating. So yes, Paul has been crystal clear that nothing, absolutely nothing, can be added to the gospel. We are saved by Christ and by Christ alone. And that's why Titus, a pure-blooded Greek, was not going to be circumcised, was not going to receive the sign of the old covenant. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for Titus. But Timothy was half Greek and half Jewish. At this point, his father might be uh, deceased, Uh, It seems like everyone knew that he was the son of a Greek father who probably didn't permit Timothy to be circumcised as an infant. And remaining uncircumcised would greatly hinder Timothy's ability to go into the synagogues with Paul and preach the gospel to unbelieving Jews. It would make that more difficult. So when it comes to personal salvation, Paul will add nothing to the finished work of Christ. 
But when it comes to bringing that salvation to others, Paul won't allow any hindrance, any stumbling block. He won't allow anything to get in the way of the gospel reaching the nations. So this is how Paul describes his ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, but not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, so Gentiles, I became as one outside the law, but not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in, their, in its blessings. Paul went to great lengths to get the gospel to the lost, to make disciples. I mean, can you just imagine you know, Paul saying, Timothy, come in here. Timothy walks in, and, and Paul's sitting there sharpening a knife. And he says, Timothy, are you ready to commit your life to full-time Christian ministry? <laughs> I would not have wanted to be Timothy in that situation, right? That's commitment. That's devotion. They were serious. Now, I know that some of you know uh, Scott and Jenny Phillips. Uh, they are, um, well, now they live down outside of Chattanooga, but they spent years and years living among the Dao people which is a tribe that lives way back in the jungles on the Indonesian side of New Guinea. And they moved into this primitive, cannibalistic, illiterate tribe that had never heard the name of Jesus. They didn't have the Bible in their language. They had never heard the gospel. And they moved in. It took them several years to learn the language and to adapt to the culture. And one day Scott was a was spending time with some of the men in the village, and you know he had always noticed that they have um, nose piercings, but not like oh, it's a cute little nose ring. No, an animal bone, <laughs> about six or eight inches long, sticking through their septum. <laughs> so he asked them about it. And he said, "So why do you guys do that?" And they said, "Well, it's just something we do in our culture. We think it's beautiful. It's kind of what the tribe does." And he said. You can pierce mine. And they were like, no, no, this, this crazy white guy's not going to want his nose pierced. And he's like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And so, I mean, the whole village got excited. They were like, oh, they're going to pierce their noses. This is awesome. Jenny hears about it. She's like, what did I just get roped into doing, you know? Um, but they come there. One of the tribal men walks out and whips out a about six inch, uh, the bone of a bat's wing, sharpened to a needle point. Grab Scott's nose, shoves it through. He said he could hear the cartilage breaking. And he couldn't smile for like a month. It hurt so bad. But after that point, they weren't considered outsiders anymore. They were given tribal names in the native language of the people. They were accepted in, not as outsiders, but as insiders, as one of the tribe. And that, plus many other things, led to the gospel being richly and warmly received by those people. Now, for you, circumcision or a bat wing nose piercing, probably not going to help you with discipleship. But there will be sacrifices. Walking with people through the hardships of life is going to be hard. It'll take time and energy. It'll be inconvenient at times. It will require you to lay down your personal preferences. I mean, the, the person that you meet with for discipleship, that person may drive you crazy on some things. Or they talk about current events and you just grit your teeth or you know, they, they, they have a personality that clashes with yours or they don't seem to be growing. It's like one step forward, two steps back and you just want to throw in the towel. But Paul says, I press on. I press on for the sake of the gospel that I might win some. And if, 
If we don't have that level of commitment, that level of devotion, we need to pray and ask God to reorient our hearts towards what's most important. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would make the final command of Jesus the first priority for each one of us. So this passage, it gives us deep conviction and high encouragement It gives us godly examples to emulate and to follow. But if we miss out on Jesus, we miss out on everything. All of this work, all of this action, it has to flow out of the gospel of grace or we will become burnt out and dried up. Notice in chapter 15, verse 40, it says that Paul chose Silas and departed having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. They had a hard road ahead of them. They had a lot of good work to do for Christ's kingdom. And so they were commended to the grace of the Lord. We love God because he first loved us and gave his son as the propitiation, as the wrath-absorbing, wrath-satisfying sacrifice for sin. We serve one another because our king, the son of man, served us and gave his life as a ransom for many. We want to tell others about Jesus and help them follow Jesus because the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus has redeemed our life. Those who have been forgiven much love much. So as you work for the king's mission, find rest in the king's grace. Now for those of you who don't know Jesus. Maybe you're, you're skeptical and you're thinking, I want to talk to someone about it. I have questions. We would love to talk with you. There's so many people here who would love to meet up with you, read the scriptures, answer your questions to the best of their ability. Maybe you're, you're interested in the gospel. You're thinking, I mean, this sounds good, but, but I, I want to know more. Okay. Discipleship takes time. Take all the time that you need to think about following Jesus, but know that he says to you, follow me, follow me. Maybe you're thinking, yeah, I've been hearing this week after week, the need to follow Jesus. And I want to, I want to become a Christian. I want to become a disciple. You can do that today. Christ has done everything that's necessary. His work is finished. He created you and he loves you and he lived for you and he died for you to take your sins far away. And he rose from the dead for you so that you could have eternal life and a new life starting today. Call out to him. Turn away from your sins. Put your faith in him and follow him on the path of discipleship today. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your glorious word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take this word and would lead us forward in obedience. I pray that if anyone here is convicted of their sin, that you would point them to Jesus. Whether a believer who needs to be pointed to Jesus again and again or someone who has not yet believed who needs to look unto Jesus for the first time. Spirit, do your work. Do your work, Spirit. Father, I pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be praised. It would be praised here in this church, here in this city, in this nation, and to the ends of the earth. So come and empower us. Help us to continue to worship your holy name. And we ask all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.